This episode of Around the Layout is brought to you by Weather My Trains. Hey, are you like me and the thought of doing a DIY weathering job on an expensive engine leaves you in fear? It's time to call in Rob Arsenault at Weather My Trains. Do what thousands of satisfied customers have done and let Rob help you notch up the realism on your layout with beautifully detailed weathering on your locomotives and rolling stock. To see what Rob can do for you, check out his website at weathermytrains.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Around the Layout, where model railroaders come to tell their story. My name is Ray Arnott. So glad you could join us on today's episode. We're going to be talking to Marty McGurk. Marty, welcome to the show. Hi, Ray. Thanks for having me. Oh, great to have you, Marty. And uh, looking forward to chatting with you. I've been uh, scrolling around your blog about the Central Vermont Railway and seeing these great photos. Boy, I'm uh, just... uh, Really excited to to get you on the show and and hear how you've gotten to where you are now. Oh, well, <laughs> glad glad to help answer any questions you have. All right, that's great. Uh, it, it's seemingly the uh, obligatory question: How did you get started in the hobby? Wow. Well, um, I probably got started in the hobby like a lot of people my age with a uh, Lionel train set. In my case, we actually got it from my. Uh, when my parents moved here from Ireland, uh, they befriended a, a, an older couple that kind of showed them the ropes and took them under their wing a little bit. And they had two adult sons, and they showed up one day with what I thought was the biggest cardboard boxes I'd ever seen, which were full of Lionel trains that had belonged to their sons. And they said, hey, would you like to play with these? So I took them down in the basement and set them up on the floor, and, and I guess I was a model railroader from that point on. <laughs> That's a great start. Be able to just uh, have somebody donate you a whole box of Lionel trains. Yeah, it was what well, was great because the budding factor on it, though, was uh, I had lots of locomotives. I had lots of cars. I only had two what I called switch tracks. Mm-hmm. And so I decided I needed more switch tracks because I, I looked at a couple of uh, plan books I had found in the library and they all showed, you know, the a crossover between it, you know, an oval track with a, with a diagonal line between it and, and a couple of sidings. And, and I didn't have enough switch tracks to do that. So we found a local hobby shop and we went there and my dad came in there with me and he took a look around and he says, well, you better come up with something better than this because we can't afford to buy more switches, (laughs) more switch tracks. Uh, So what he noticed was that the HO switches were, you know, at the time, an Atlas snap switch was five bucks. And, uh, <laughs> you know, an Atlas switch at that time was 25 or $30. Right. And so, yeah, he, he decided that I should become an HO scale modeler at that point. Um, so we, I ended up getting an, an HO scale train set not too long after. That. And the first HO scale train set I had was a, and I don't know if you remember these or not, the Atherin Hustler. Do you remember that at all? I don't remember it, but oh, uh, that was, I, is, I know the Atherin part, but tell me about yeah. it. So the Atherin Hustler was great. It had a fantastic dual rubber band drive. <laughs> and and the best part about it is it had two speeds, fast and faster. Yeah. And then when you stopped it, it kind of wobbled back and forth. It didn't actually stop. It sort of moved back and forth a lot. Uh, that was my first one. It was painted for the Chessie system. Yep. And I, I don't know how else to describe it, except it was a little stubby end cab switcher. Yep. The next train set I ended up with was a AHM uh, old timer set. Yep. And that was a 440 when a couple of uh, open platform passenger cars. And then I got a set of buildings with that also, which was like the Rico station. And the, there was a barber shop and an old West town. So I immediately became a 19th century modeler at that point. And my first layout was actually a four by eight sheet of plywood that we put between two sawhorses out in the garage at this point. And the best about that is I had very realistic grades because the plywood sagged in the middle. So the train (laughs) would go uphill in one side and downhill and then back uphill and downhill again. So it was a very mountainous route. Um, (laughs) Eventually I, I discovered 
Atlas track planning books. I don't, do you remember Caldors? Oh, yes. Yep. Okay. So Caldors was just down the street from the house where I grew up. And they actually sold, they had a decent selection of model railroad stuff at that time. You could go in there and you could find, you know, Atlas switches. And they had very early Atlas locomotives, the, the Atlas Jeep 40 and Jeep 38, the old Roco ones. Mm-hmm. And they had a lot of Athern, you know, uh, what do you call them? The blue box kits. And so I, I over the summer cat and whatnot, making some money cutting the grass, I, I bought some better quality HO stuff and bought some more tracks, including some more switches, and built a layout from one of John Armstrong's old Atlas track planning books. So Atlas at the time had two or three track plan books that uh, that were track plans that were designed by John Armstrong, who designed a lot of layouts for Model Railroader and other magazines over the years. and. I built one or two of those uh, on my piece of plywood. And by this point, I figured out I needed to have framing and stuff. But I learned a lot of basics of the mechanics of building a layout, actually, from from some of those track plan books. Because they describe bench work and they describe risers and, and cutting the plywood. And, of course, we didn't have a jigsaw, a power saw. So I cut the – I did – what we called cookie cutter construction where you build all the risers and then you cut lines in the plywood and you sit the plywood sheet on top of that and then sort of press down and screw them down to the screw the plywood mm-hmm. down to the risers and that creates your grades and your your you know elevation changes for the track uh, i by first layout i cut all those out with a handsaw wow yeah and yes i was determined at that time i guess <laughs> and, yeah so yeah, you know, back in the old technology of of hand saws and you know books and going to the library and you know I I didn't I didn't even know you know it's funny you mentioned Caldor Department Store is like you know your, your source for model railroading supply I would I would have never thought it I mean I remember going into Caldor as a kid I don't remember the trains being there but we had yeah we had um they they didn't la- I mean they were gone at some point when I was still living in Connecticut mm-hmm. and. Uh, the, but by then I had found, uh, we had two really decent hobby shops, not too far from the house. Yep. Uh, one of them, they, they upped and moved further from my house. So when I was in junior high and high school, before I got my driver's license, I used to spend, I would take a Saturday and ride my bike to the hobby shop. And it was about a, about an eight or nine mile bike ride one way. Yeah. And, you know, down route one and down, you know, post road. And everything oh boy. Else. Yeah. It was rather exciting. Yeah. Uh, and so, but I would, I would get in there and, and that's when I, you know, discovered things like the magazines and I, uh, the, the owner of one, one was called family hobbies and people from Southwestern Connecticut, old timers probably remember that if any of them are still listening. Yeah. Uh, but family hobbies was one where uh, the owner's son, uh, he was, he was older than me. Uh, he was probably 10, 15 years older than me, but he was very much into painting, custom painting stuff. Okay. And he custom painted a lot of Grand Trunk. He was into the Grand Trunk. And so he custom painted a lot of those black, you know, black diesels with red ends with the wiggly worms on them. And I, at some point, he either set me up with everything I needed to paint stuff or I, I decided to try to do it myself and it didn't work that well. And he helped me out. And uh, so that's when I started custom painting things. And along the way, we went up to new London one, one time with my, again, with my dad and my uncle and a couple other folks. And it was to visit a submarine, a U.S. Navy submarine had an open house. And so we, we were on the state pier in new London. We were, you know, doing the thing where we crawl around the submarine and we got up. And at that time, the, uh, the center of Vermont ran down state pier. That's mm-hmm. really where the railroad ended in new London. And we came up there and came out of the submarine and we we're walking along the pier. And I looked up and there was this train sitting there. There were these three, uh, but I'm assuming were Jeep nines. They might've been RS 11s, but I think they were Jeep nines. And I was very curious about them and looking around them and the, the engineer looked down and said, "Oh, you like this? Do you want to go for a ride?" Oh boy! And I was probably—I might have been eleven at the time, eleven or twelve. 
And I was on that locomotive and in that cab before my mom, my dad, or anybody else knew where I was. I was gone. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> And he, he was just running around the, you know, running around the train. So he took me down to the end of the yard and then did whatever he was doing and came back up the other side. And, and of course, you know, nowadays they probably would have called out the FBI, the police and everybody else. And, and all that, all that happened here was I waved a lot and my dad took my picture of me in the cab as I'm driving by. <laughs> so. oh, that's awesome. That is so very cool. So, yeah. So that's kind of where I, I, I guess I became a Central Vermont fan that day. Uh, yeah, that that would win you over, wouldn't it? Yeah, <laughs> come for a ride, kid. You're gonna love CV forever. Well, our other our other uh, option, you know, was the was the former New Haven, mm-hmm. which and I can remember New Haven paint schemes. I mean, I can I'm old enough that I can remember seeing them. They were, of course, all trapped out and filthy, and and Penn Central was no great shakes. Uh, and then I had this, you know, the the other option was kind of this neat looking railroad with, you know, nice friendly employees and stuff. And that was just sort of how I started being a Central Vermont fan. So either right after that or right before that is when I got to know this guy that was painting all the Grand Trunk stuff. And that's when I started doing that. And I started painting up Atherin Jeep 9s, which is the Jeep 9 we could get, uh, yep. and model model power RS11s. And at one point, I had as many Jeep 9s as Essential Vermont did, all custom painted, until they wrecked a few of those, a few of theirs. Yep. Um, and so I I had that along, and then all that got packed up when I went off to college and, and went through my Navy training. Um, I found myself a few years later after... I'd been in the Navy for about a year or two. I was up in Newport at a, at actually at diesel engineering school and I was learning how to, how to operate Alco 251 Charlie engines. Mm-hmm. The ship I was on was actually Alco powered. Yep. And um, so I was there and I, I had a free afternoon one day and I went to a hobby shop. I hadn't really looked at train stuff. I had read the magazines when I was in college, uh, looked at some stuff, you know, done a little bit of rail fanning down in South Carolina, nothing too intense. I simply didn't have time or, or the inclination. And, but when I was up in Newport for the school, I was up there for about six or eight weeks and I had a free afternoon. So I went over to, uh, I think it was called Appenog Color, if I remember right. It was something like that. Yeah. It was a great hobby shop. I mean, I yep. had, it was like one of the better ones I'd ever been in. And in there they had, I, I still remember it's, they had what was then the brand new Atlas N scale RS3. Yeah. Which was like, oh my, a, a locomotive that actually runs an N scale. And they were had it running around a circle of track, but they purposely had it going really, really slow. And they had a sign on front of it said, Yes, this locomotive is actually moving. And <laughs> and we were all amazed by that because back then, you know, N scale was basically a little mini coffee grinder. And the I didn't buy a locomotive or I didn't buy any trains that day, but I bought two things. I bought a Central Vermont uh, book that Karstens had published by uh, by Ed Bo- a guy named Ed Bodet. And what was neat about that is I was really familiar with the Central Vermont, you know, with the diesels and the you know the nineteen seventies, early eighties era Central Vermont, and the and and. While I was in Newport, I did I did a fair amount of rail fanning up in New England. I went up to Vermont several times and rail fanned up there. Mm-hmm. And so I was familiar with the railroad as it looked then. And it was basically a, a bridge route. I mean, it didn't have a lot of what we would consider switching or operating interest. There were a couple of places, but not much. And But I bought this book that was basically all about the railroad as it had looked 30 or 40 years earlier. And I thought, well, this is kind of neat. And I bought that one. And then I bought one of a what turned out to be a seven-part series of books on the Central Vermont by Bob Jones. And they only had one volume in the store at the time. And so I bought that. And I, I mean, I paid almost $30 for it. I still have it sitting on my bookshelf behind me here. <laughs> and at the time, you know, $30 for a book was just hideous. But it was, I, I thought every picture that had ever been 
found of the center of Vermont was in these two books. I thought there's no way there was more pictures than this. And of course I was completely wrong. <laughs> and so I, I bought those books and I decided, well, this is really interesting. I wonder what else I can learn about this. So I was in theory supposed to go on shore duty and I ended up deciding that there was a Boston and Maine historical society. There was a new Haven historical society. There was, you know, a, a uh, Baltimore and Ohio, et cetera. All these railroads had historical societies. And at the time, uh, a magazine called Mainline Modeler used to publish lists of historical societies. And I looked in there and I didn't see a Central Vermont one. So I sent a letter to Railroad Model Craftsman and Model Railroader. And I said, anybody interested in starting a CV historical society, give me a call. Well, here I am, this guy that's at the time living in Virginia Beach, Virginia, wanting to start a Central Vermont Historical Society. And that, that got some people's hackles up. They're like, well, why do you want to do this? And, and what's your interest in this? And I explained it away to some of them. But one day a phone rang, and it was a gentleman named uh, Dr. Alan Irwin. And Alan uh, eventually became a very, very good friend of mine, a very dear friend. And he said, well, here's the thing. He says, uh, I, I, I'd be glad to help you out. But we have to do this, this, and this. You know, this is my stipulations to helping you out. And I said, well, that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, what I didn't realize was at the time, and I came to find out soon enough, is that Alan was like a, a CV diesel fanatic. I don't even know how else to phrase it. I mean, if you wanted to know any detail on any Central Vermont diesel locomotive, he knew what it was. But he didn't really know much about steam engines. And he says, well, I, I know a guy who – who's like the steam engine guy. So, okay, well, he put me in touch with him. And so the four of us ended up starting the CV Historical Society. And uh, that's that's still going on. I mean, it's still going pretty strong. Um, so that was kind of my first involvement in doing any kind of hobby writing. I was the I was the editor. And we were talking a minute ago about, you know, you have to research stuff in libraries. I came up with ideas for, well, we want to do a, an article on, on this particular type of locomotive. And I will send around a letter to the four or five guys that might know something about that look, that class of locomotives or might have pictures. And I'd hand write a letter, uh, go to the library to run copies of the letter because you couldn't print it at home because you didn't have a printer. And so I would then send it out to four or five of them. They'd send me an answer back and I'd take all these answers and use it to develop an article for the newsletter. And we did that for several years. And then eventually we got email and we thought the, you know, <laughs> that was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Oh yeah. And yeah. <laughs> but during that time I was supposed to, I have a, um, like I said, I was supposed to go on shore duty but the Navy decided to send me to a different school and put me back on a ship. So I did another year and a half on a ship. So I was running the historical society while I was on the ship. Well, that was, that was an interesting challenge. Um, so yeah, I, I can only imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually I got back to the States, back on dry land. Uh, and my last duty station in the Navy was in the DC was in Naval sea systems command in Washington, DC. And so I got to know a lot of the local modelers around here. Paul Dolkus, uh, became a really good friend of mine, still is a good friend of mine. Um, we got to know some young whippersnapper named Lance Mindheim, uh, Bernie Kempinski. There's, there's a real collection of really, really good model railroaders in the DC area. Yeah. And I got to know a lot of them over the years. And then there was one point where I, I went into a store and I found that uh, I, Finera and Camerlingo is a company that still makes resin freight car kits, HO scale resin freight cars. They make other scales too, but mostly HO. And I found that they had made, they were having, or they were making for another company called Steam Shack, a set of Vermont boxcars. So I, I bought one of these kits, which was like $30, which I'd never paid $30 for a freight car kit before. And I took it home and I figured out how to build it and I put it together. And at some point, I, I ended up contacting uh, Bill Schomburg at Railroad Model Craftsman and asked him if he wanted me to write a review of this kit, of this car. And he said, sure, send it in to me. 
So I, I sent it in to him, and he says, oh, and I actually wrote it, and I took it down to Paul Dulgas's layout, and Paul photographed it for me and gave me the slides, and I sent it to Bill along with the, with the review, and he published it. So that was the first time it had been published in a real magazine. Right. And, and I thought, well, now, now I'm on my way. I'm going to become a professional model railroad author. So the next thing I did is I had scratch built a, uh, a milk car. And if you look hard enough on the blog, you will find a picture of this milk car. And I scratch built this milk car. And then I took the most, I was going to take the pictures myself. And they were the most God awful photographs ever taken. <laughs> and I, I sent them in to, to Bill, and he says, the article's fine. He says, I can definitely use the article. He says, but I can't tell which of these fuzzy blobs in this picture is your milk <laughs> car. And I said, oh, well, I'll, I'll keep working on it. I'll keep working on it. And for whatever reason, I didn't ask Paul to photograph it. I think maybe pride or maybe I was determined to show that I could do this myself. And, yeah. and I just it just never went anywhere. So I eventually found those pictures you know, a couple of years ago and I put them on the blog, the, um, I got out of the Navy and I ended up through a variety of circumstances that we don't have to discuss. I ended up up in Vermont and, and I was working for a recycling company in Vermont and things were going okay. And then all of a sudden the company, the guy that owned the company sold it to another guy and we had four managers at the, here's the situation, right? We had four managers at the company. I was one of the four and we had the owner. Well, the owner sold the company to this other guy who had four adult sons, all of whom planned to move to Vermont. Oh boy. And I'm looking at the handwriting on the wall and I'm going, there's yeah. no way these guys are going to work for us. Yeah. There might be a little nepotism <laughs> yeah. stuff going. So, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, we might have a, we might have a little bit of time here, but not much. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, Long story short, I guess the week before Thanksgiving, they gave us all two weeks severance. Oh, boy. So have, have a good time. And at that time, it was really hard to find a job in Vermont. So so my wife and the kids, they, they left to go down and spend Christmas with, you know, the holidays with family down in Connecticut. And I was going to try to find something. But, of course, nobody was doing any interviewing the week before Thanksgiving. Yeah. So I, there was a guy that ran a little hobby shop up there in Shelburne. And it was it was typical of most little retail stores in in rural New England. It was basically in a garage. It was in a garage behind his house. Yep. And I went in there and he said, "Well, you know how to custom paint stuff, right?" Because I would, I had bought detail parts and things like that from him. I said, "Yeah, I've done some custom painting." He says, "Can you paint some Vermont, Vermont railway locomotives for me for Christmas?" Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, I guess. I said, what, what do you need? He says, no, I just, what he did was he took, you know, regular uncreated Athern SW1500s and Jeep 38-2s, et cetera. And he just painted them red and put Vermont Railway decals on them. And, and he made up his own train sets to sell in the store for Christmas. So the kids that came in, it looked just like they saw run through their hometown, right? So I Marty, said, let me stop you real quick. That's the hobby shop I've been looking for. Because I always go from, you know, town to town. I've traveled a lot, and you always want to get to that hobby shop where they're like doing the local flavor, right? And, <laughs> yeah, and, and I've never found that. it. You you had it right there in in Shelburne. Oh, yeah, that's, and my guy, awesome. and actually, my neighbor across the street was the president of the Vermont Railway. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so it was one where we lived. We actually rented the house, but he was across the street from me. He was the I said. I just talked to him one day and he's like, Oh, I work for the railroad, uh, Vermont railway. Oh yeah. 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 That's great. That's great. And yeah. he says, yeah, why don't you come over sometime? So I got a couple of cab rides on the Vermont railway too. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> so was, I didn't realize when he said he worked for the Vermont railway, I didn't know. I thought maybe he was like the, the maintenance guy or something. I didn't yeah, he, realize he, he was, he rented the whole place. That was a small outfit, but at the time yeah. it was, but and yeah. So I painted, I probably painted God and that, that, Christmas season, I must have painted two dozen. I, I was like blowing my nose and signal red was coming out. Um, <laughs> I painted like two dozen locomotives. And I mean, I, it was like a factory. I was, you know, I decaling them all. And, and then there were several that he wanted done, kind of done up right, you know. So there was a, there's sort of the train set ones. And he yeah. said, can you do a few of them with, like, you know, with the plows and the right horn and the 
butter hoses and all the other stuff, grab irons and all that stuff. So I did a few of those. And, um, and I think I did a bunch of freight cars too, if I remember right. And certainly probably did cabooses, although I don't think Vermont Railway actually had cabooses, but we just painted cabooses up for it too. Sure. And, and the, uh, or at least they had them, they weren't using them at the time. So I, I did that and I was tooling along with that. And then the, the phone rang and it was a headhunter. Mm. And he said, this all, this all connects together. The, this headhunter says, you know, I, I, I'm actually, I specialize in finding, uh, you know, people that, that can go work at a hobby publication in the upper mid or hobby publishing house in the upper Midwest that specializes in, in hobby publications. And it didn't take too much math to figure out what he was talking <laughs> about, Kambach. And yeah. I said, great. I said, I, I said, I don't know. Do you mind me asking where you got my name? He says, oh, I got your name from Bill Schomburg at Railroad Model Craftsman. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know whether to be, you know, thrilled that Bill had given him my name or figuring that, you know, if, I, if I've got to send somebody to the competition, I'm going to sell them this schmuck. I'm not sure. I still to this day don't know what it was. And, uh, and of course, Paul had done a lot of work for uh, Kambach over the years. I mean, a ton of work. And he said, well, Paul said, yeah, they, you know, Kambach called me and checked you out. And I said, all right. So I ended up flying out there a couple of days later. And uh, lo and behold, like a month later, we were moving to Wisconsin. Wow. And I started at, uh, actually started at Classic Toy Trains. So, which is the Lionel and American Flyer magazine. And before I went out there for the, inter when I figured out the interview was for that magazine, and I, I did not know anything about Lionel Trains, really. I mean, I wasn't very knowledgeable about them at all. So I went to the Burlington library for like three days before I went out there for the interview. And I, I read every issue of classic toy trains cover to cover. I read every book they had on Lionel and American flyer and tried to memorize everything, you know, memorize key points so that I sounded like I knew what I was talking about. So and there's I a, le there's a lesson in preparing for an interview for Marty McGurk, right? <laughs> Whether you're doing it for trains or something else, go in knowing something about whatever the company is doing. That'll, that'll definitely help. And that's, that's right. That's, yeah. that's, that's a, that's a good takeaway. I must've done okay. Cause I got the job. Right. So the, uh, and, and I started at Kambach in 1990, that would have been 1994. I started there and uh, probably a year and a half later, they had by that point realized that my heart really wasn't in three rail. <laughs> and especially when I was like building models at home that were all these detailed scale models. And so, yep. they, so when an opening came up at, at MR, I went over to MR and the first thing I did at MR was a, uh, a small end scale layout on a door. Okay. So every December and January issue, MR does a like a beginner's project layout, and they try to walk somebody through building a layout step by step, soup to nuts. And since I was the new guy, they said, well, why don't you do it? And since you don't have that much time, why don't you make it really small? And since it's going to be really small, why don't you do it in N scale? Right. So I didn't know much about N scale, but I built an N scale layout. So, And people still, still come up to me and I mean that they love that layout. Wow. And that's 25 plus years ago now. I mean, it's getting towards 30 years actually. <laughs> and right. Yeah. So it, yeah, they still tell me that their first layout was the Carolina. It was called the Carolina central. And yep. I, I still have people tell me that they love the Carolina central, that they built the Carolina central. And that led to, uh, there, uh, Kambach had years for many years had published a book called the N scale primer and, or primer, I guess, depends on, on where you're from. <laughs> and, sure. and Russ Larson had written that, but he was then at this point, he was the publisher. He didn't have time to deal with it. And he, he came in and said, well, you're building that N scale layout. I guess he figured I must be an N scaler. <laughs> I guess I fooled him. <laughs> and, yep, yep. and he said, well, he says, why don't we need to redo that book? Why don't you redo the book? And I said, well, okay. So we made a deal and I actually made a separate contract with when you're an editor there and you do a book, you actually do a separate contract for the book. It's not, unless mm -hmm. you're in the books department, it's not part of your job. It's done separate from your job. And so I, 
I wrote an N scale book and it's still in print today. <laughs> wow. I've, I've updated it once. I did a pretty significant update on it about 10, 15 years ago, including putting a new, uh, building a whole new layout that I put in that book. And I think the second book has the layout is much, much better. It's, I think it's a much, it's sort of a, it's, it's a Carolina Central on steroids. It's what I would have done with the Carolina Central had I had enough time to really dive into it. It's closer to it. It's like a three and a half by six foot N scale layout. So it, it has staging and it has, you know, an interchange and it's got other things that just were not on the Carolina Central, which was just on like a, a two, a two foot by six foot door or something that I found at Menards for four bucks. Yeah. Um, and, but still people prefer the care. I've had people buy that book and say that they were disappointed. The Carolina Central was not in the second edition of the book. Yeah. So I'm I'm just imagining, you know, when you wrote this and when you said it was ninety four when you first did N Scale on a Door, right? It was right around that time. Did yeah, that right? it was about then, yeah. Yeah. So from that and then you do this update. I mean, you you've must have seen such a vast improvement in N Scale in general from from ninety four to now. Because I mean you, you see N Scale and I remember, you know, messing around about that same era with N Scale. And yeah. now seeing what they're doing with N Scale is just a, a such a huge improvement. They've done a great job with it. I, I used to have to, the first book was, uh, I had to put in there a whole description on how you convert locomotives from, from Rapido to microtrains couplers. Mm-hmm. And at the time, you, you'd have to do is go in, you know, you'd have to buy from microtrains, essentially a coupler that was mounted to a pilot to fill that gaping hole in the front of the locomotive when you took the repeat, you get the truck swing, you know, had this big rapido, this C shaped coupler, this enormous mm-hmm. thing. And you take that off and then you'd end up with this, the locomotive would look gap tooth on it and you'd have to fill that in. And microtrains actually sold couplers that you would put in there and, and fill that gap and then screw the cup, the micro coupler in place. I, I'm certain they still sell them, but I don't think they sell as well. But you used to go in the hobby shop and the end scale section of the hobby shop would be a wall of just these coupler conversions for locomotives because each one was specific to the local, you know, the the Atlas Jeep, Jeep nine has this one or Jeep seven or whatever it was, you know, and the, and the Cato, this has this, right? So the, um, the other thing I did, so for the second version of the book, I didn't even really have to cover that. I just put a picture of it in there and said, you know, if you, if you have a locomotive that has this gap in it, get one of these things. And the other thing that was interesting was the very first book, I had a whole chapter on wiring because that's, you know, one of the, you, know, you do a chapter on scenery and a chapter on wiring and a chapter on rolling stock and et cetera. And that's how these beginner's books are structured. And so I had a chapter on wiring and I went into excruciating detail on how to wire for cab control. You know, block, you know, selector A, selector B, you know, all that stuff. And this, and I, I put a line in there at the end that's saying, and, and HO modelers are just starting, you know, HO was starting to get, you know, command control. We didn't even call it DCC. It was just command yeah. control. Yeah. And, and I had had command control on my HO layouts. I had had a system called Keller Onboard. And that was the first system I had probably in the late eighties or so. And, um, and then eventually I ended up getting uh, a a Wangro system, which was essentially what eventually became North coast engineering and the, but N scale, you couldn't get decoders and N scale locomotives at that time. I mean, it just, you couldn't fit them in there. And so Hornby had a system that Jim Kelly was using on his Tehachapi layout where you basically had to take all the guts out of a locomotive and put the, put the receiver in the locomotive called a receiver. You had to put the receiver in a locomotive and that's what, and then hardwire it to the units on either end of it. Right. Then you'd have like a three unit set. And uh, that was the way you had to do command control. So the very first book I said, you know, maybe someday in the far distant future, end scalers will be able to have command control layouts. And then fast forward to the second issue, the second edition of the book, you know, some t- eight, eight years later, 10 years later. And I was able to show, you know, here's, here's the factory installed decoders you can get right now. Nice. And, 
And oh, by the way, now you can get sound in N scale locomotives. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, so it was. It made the wiring section, wiring chapter, much simpler. And basically, in the second edition of the book, I said once you get past uh, two wires to your starter power pack, your MRC power pack, and and run your train around in a circle. Once you run to run two trains, go get a DCC system. Don't yeah, even yep. don't even mess with the rest of this stuff. I talk often about. I think I miss the golden era of of railroading, where you know we talk about the history and stuff, but. I don't think I missed an era when it comes to the, the to the way the DC used to be with my, I'm I'm kind of kind of glad I didn't, you know. I, I I mean I had the Tyco power pack back in the day, but I didn't have the you know where you're flipping switches and train I I completely skipped over that and got an NCE power cab put in my hand and boy boy I'm I I'm glad that I could fast forward through that part. Yeah, we we didn't talk about this but when I was a kid I belonged to a club in Fairfield and mm-hmm. And it was one of these classic old layouts in that they had a, it was in the basement of a church and they had, it was a, it was a big room. I don't, it probably was, it probably was 15 by 30 or 40 feet. It's probably not much bigger than my current layout is honestly, but at the time it seemed enormous to me. Sure. And there was the, the two doors, one on either of the two long walls. And there was like a five foot aisle that came down the front. And that was for the public to come look at the layout during the open houses. Right. I mean, that was the purpose of that aisle. And then there was essentially just a, a giant donut of, of bench work with a big, huge pit in the middle, big open area in the middle. And that's where the operators were. That's where you operated this thing from. And mm-hmm. I, I guess they, they kind of justified it to themselves because it operated a lot like the the old New Haven uh, shoreline did, you know, the, yep. the, the, four, the four track route. And so it was all tower operated, but you would, you would only run, you would run every train that was going around on the layout when you were the tower operator, but you only ran it for the 15 or 20 feet of that tower that you were controlling. And then you just passed it on to the next guy and it would always, the trains would always, stutter and stall and and jerk a little bit because the, the power was never perfectly set the same way yeah it was uh and that's how you had operating sessions that was just you know and who's got my train and everything it was just yeah it just was um, <laughs> boy we've come a long way from from that that's for sure so so i think we left off we were talking about you out and you know writing writing these books uh, how do you how do you get from Wisconsin down now to the D.C. area? How did that uh, all evolve? Well, about uh, a little before 2000, I guess, um, I started talking to some some of the guys out at Intermountain Railway Company in Colorado. Yeah. And there was a point where between 2001-ish, late 2001, and early, two, well, early 2002, really, because 9-11 happened. But um, – 2002 to 2005 or six, I actually worked at Intermountain Railway Company. Okay. So I was out there for a while. I was the vice president of product development. And then uh, 2005, the by now retired or by then retired admiral I had worked for in Washington when I was at Naval Sea Systems Command called me and made me an offer I couldn't refuse. I mean, I don't know how else to say it, but that's basically (laughs) what it was. And yeah. so we packed everything up and uh, tore down the layout I had started in Colorado, and we moved to uh, to the D.C. area. And we've been here ever since, and I've been working at the same company ever since. And actually, I've been working at the same program ever since. So so your your first CV layout, was that out in Colorado? No, it was actually the first the first layout I had. Well, I had layouts when I was a kid. Right. Um, and... And yeah, your I, first your first layouts as a, in adulthood, I should probably clarify. First layout that. I had in adulthood that was my home layout was in was when we lived in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. Okay. And we had a farmhouse that was about 150, 160 years old. And it had a basement to match. I mean, it, it looked like the set from Silence of the Lambs. And but I put a layout down there and a good friend of mine, a guy named Ian Rice, helped me design it. And at the time, we the first thing we designed was a massive N-scale central Vermont layout. Yeah. 
And if you want to see the track plan for that, it appeared in Model Railroader. I think it was March 2000. It showed up in Model Railroader. It might have been February, but it was somewhere around there. And I did a Railroad You Could Model article on the Central Vermont of the transition era. Yep. And and that would have covered White River Junction to Essex Junction. It was all the towns in, in between, and it was fairly elaborate layout. It was the largest layout Ian Rice had ever designed. Then a couple of things happened that you know, we were about to start building that layout. I had built the Essex Junction section as a module in an apartment that we were renting. And that showed up in, in an article in Model Road Planning at some point around there. And my intention was to basically expand on that module and make it a full end scale layout. And then two, two things happened, really. So Lifelike released the Sea Liner, the Proto 1000 Sea Liner. Which, when the CV dieselized in 1952, dieselized the fruit through freights in 1952, it did so with Canadian National Diesels. They didn't actually get Jeep Nines until 57. Hmm. And when they got the Jeep Nines, the steam engines went away like literally the next day. There was no time period on the CV where the steam engines ran with the with the Jeep Nines, and yep. so. But the Sea Liners were around for you know seven or eight years, and so. I thought, well, no, was, I had bought a couple of brass sea liners years before that. And these things were made by a company called Red Ball. And basically, they were honorary coffee grinders. I mean, I could never get them to work. <laughs> but I figured if I if I can't have the sea liners, then I can't really model the railroad exactly as it was at that time. So I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll stick with N scale and, and do what I can with N scale and, and kind of squint a little bit when things go by. And I'll do like the Jeep 9 era in N scale. Yeah. And so the sea liner showed up and then literally like a month and a half later, Bachman releases this little 280 locomotive in their spectrum line. And I took that Bachman 280. So the product sample shows up at MR and Andy Sparandio, who is our editor, right? Gets this thing. And of course it's painted and lettered for the Santa Fe, but it looks nothing like a Santa Fe 280. I mean, it doesn't look anything like a Santa Fe 280. Yeah. And he comes in and goes, this thing looks like it might be the right wheelbase or something for, for a CV engine. He says, why don't you check it out and see if you do something with it? And Ian happened to be visiting at the time. He was in the States at the time. And so we took a scale drawing of a CV280 and we laid this Bachman thing on top of it. And the, the wheelbase was almost identical. I mean, it was, oh. and that's the trick with steam engines, get the wheelbase right. And, he says, well, I, I think, you know, if you chop this up a bit, and some, do some tweaks is how he phrased it. He says, <laughs> I think if you do some tweaks, I think we can, uh, we can make a, a respectable stand-in, you know, CV280 out of this. So I rounded up a bunch of stuff, you know, parts and bits and pieces and details. And I gave him the engine and I sent him back to England with it. And it was a lot more chopping and hacking than he, than he had bargained for. Trust me. But uh, <laughs> what he sent me back was a beautiful model. And I, I actually have several brass CV locomotives of the same class. And when I put them next to each other, nobody can tell the difference. Wow. Nobody can tell me which one is the Bachman conversion and which is the brass engine until they run. And the Bachman engine runs much better. Right. And so uh, that, that kind of is what pushed me back into HO scale. The problem I had with HO scale with that first layout was I couldn't fit the prototype scenes in the basement in HO scale. They just didn't, they didn't fit in there. And at this time, remember everybody was, you know, everything was all about long main line and, and multiple town layouts. And you had to have 12 people over for an operating session and all this kind of stuff. And that was yeah. sort of where the hobby was. Yeah. Big and empire stuff. Yeah. Big empire stuff. Right. Although I had, you know, I had, th you know, three kids under the age of 10 at that point or 12. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, scouts and football and all that other band and everything else. And so, um, so what we ended up doing was and Ian said, well, why don't you, if you can't fit the prototype scenes in here, why don't you try what we call composite modeling? And what the Brits call composite modeling is what we really call prototype freelancing. Yep. And I said, oh, that'd be cool. And then I did a little bit more research and I figured out that there was going to be a railroad built between Palmer, Massachusetts and Providence, Rhode Island. 
called mm-hmm. the Southern New England that yeah. got as far as being graded. And, and you obviously know the tale of this thing. And yeah. so For anybody who doesn't go ahead and research it. Cause it's a, it's a very interesting story. It's called the Titanic railroad. The Titanic railroad. Yep. And so, so basically what I did is, is design this layout that was a, a what if, what if the Southern New England had actually been finished? Mm-hmm. So, it's a subsidiary of the Centre Vermont, so the the locomotives look a lot like Centre Vermont locomotives, but not quite. And and it was amazing because I didn't realize this at the time, but Bachman actually used the Southern New England's two eight O's as the prototypes for those locomotives. I mean, that was their their exact prototype. You, know, you take it right out of the box and and not have to do a seventy hour conversion. You can just put a put a new number board on it and a couple of bell move a bell around and and it was amazing how much it looked like a Southern New England two eight O. Right. <laughs> so I I did that and uh, that was that layout. And then when we moved to Colorado, I started rebuilding the Southern New England in Colorado. Um, and it was, I was just starting the scenery there. And actually, a guy that helped me in Colorado build the layout is a guy named Matt Gadinsky, who I brought out to work for me at Intermountain. And I don't know if you've ever heard of a company called Fox Valley Models. Yes, we have. But Matt started Fox Valley Models in okay. Colorado with me. So, um, yeah, so the... Uh, so when I moved back here, I, I scrapped all that whole layout because I didn't know what our living situation was going to be here. We didn't have a house already, and I didn't yeah. re- really want to go through the expense and effort of moving a bunch of plywood and things across the country. So I didn't really keep any of the of the components of the railroad. And then a few years after we moved here, got settled in a job, and we built a house in Manassas, and that's where the Roxbury subdivision layout was. And I want to get to that. I, I do have a burning question. I, I hear you talking about your time at Model Railroader and, you know, writing, you know, starting of classic toy trains and then working your way to MR and the books that you've written. You, you talk about some of those things that you were doing uh, with, with your own layout, but then you reference back. Did it did it seem like it was kind of everything for the for the publisher and not, not in a mean way, but like everything you seem to do, it all seemed to tie back to model railroad or like you're doing a, your layout in the basement, but it seems to be a, a topic of an article or did it, did it kind of, did that take away from the hobby for you? Because it was kind of like work is model railroading. And then you come home and model railroading kind of seemed like work too. No, not really. No. Not, it, I, and honestly wasn't, we actually, now from what I can tell, and of course this, my observations are strictly observations. I don't know. But from what I can tell, uh, nowadays they spend a lot more time doing hands-on modeling. The staff at at Kalmbach does. Uh, they seem to spend a lot of time in the workshop. Uh, we spend a lot of time in front of computers, um, and and I think part of that is they're doing a lot more multimedia video kind of things. We didn't do any of that. We did a couple of videotapes, and and God, we dreaded it. I mean, it was awful. Yep. Um, but the if you want to see the worst model railroad VHS tape ever made, look at airbrushing with the staff of model railroad or from <laughs> my time there. It was just god all the techniques are great, but the whole thing was just bad. A, a low uh, production value, would you it say? Was, well, it was I think they brought in a professional video producer guy. Yep. But it it's 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 as bad as like watching a sexual harassment video that HR puts out. You know, it's just like, <laughs> oh God. Please, somebody tell a joke, smile, yep. do something, interact with another human being. <laughs> just, just like, it was just, oh, it was god awful. So for uh, for for editors, for you know, for editors, we were great actors, I guess. Yeah. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so so when I got a chance to work on my own projects, I really enjoyed it. I mean, I didn't mind doing it, and I I certainly did a lot of other modeling that was never in the magazine. Um. There was there were times that it was you know so the the Southern New England layout actually ended up in Model Railroad Planning, uh, it's it was on the cover of MRP two thousand actually, and that was because Tony Custer, who's the editor of Model Railroad Planning, was visiting and he was looking for something 
that talked about kind of cramming a layout in an awkward space. And he came down to my basement and saw my awkward space and said, you did a great job on it. When can I have the article? <laughs> and, you know, when, when Combox kind of foot in the bill for the layout, it's kind of difficult to say, no, I don't want to do it. So, right. um, yeah, so that was, that was how that happened. But yeah, other, other projects I did because I wanted to, and they ended up being articles, yep. uh, things that have nothing to do with the center of Vermont. I just, just wanted to do them. Um, I did, a, I did paint shop for many years and I really enjoyed paint shop. Uh, or the, the column that they, we had called paint shop. And I really liked doing that. And if I didn't have something that I thought was a good, you know, big project for the month, I would paint something up myself, you know, like seaboard airline citrus FTs, which was just still remains the, the toughest paint scheme I've ever done. Um, yeah, but so it, did, was, it didn't work itself into ju just being a job. You always seem to enjoy the projects that were handed to you, even though they were technically, they were technically work. Yeah, there were some that were just that were the worst part. The worst things to do were product reviews. Honestly, I dreaded those. Hmm. Um, I, they were just they were just god awful. And the other thing that happened was the you know, when you first get there, you're like a kid in the candy store, and somebody comes in and goes, "Do you want to review this?" Or here you go, and they and they hand you you know this locomotive, and and you usually get to keep it. Not always, but sometimes you get. Most of the time, you get to keep it, and you go, mm -hmm. "This is great, and this is great, and this is great." And what you start realizing is, after about a year or so, we had we had a table outside the managing editor's office that would just be stuff that nobody wanted would end up on that table. And after a while, you just started bringing the <laughs> back in and putting it there, and going, "I don't want this in my house. I don't know what to do with it." So. <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. and so you know and then people that worked in other departments in the company who might have been auto railroaders would come by and they and they you know run off with their little treasures and and run away but uh yeah, yeah it wasn't it, i mean it wasn't like overwhelming i don't want to create the impression that there was some sort of hobby shop laying around in the hallway out there it wasn't it might have been two or three things on the table any any yeah. given day and then, yep. and then there was just the stuff that was like, why would anybody, why would anybody want this, let alone review it? And stuff. <laughs> that was too funny. So, uh, let's let's get to Virginia because I want to I want to hear about these uh, two CV uh, railroads that you built. Sure. Let's, so let's talk about the Roxbury sub. So Roxbury sub version 1.0 was a double deck layout. It was about thirteen. Uh, 18 by 40 or so feet uh, on one side of our basement in Manassas. And it went through many, many, many fits and starts, but it basically represented the central Vermont. Uh, and it was White River Junction through Waterbury uh, at Randolph and Waterbury and, S and ended at Essex Junction and then into staging. And it was a it was a point to point layout. Uh, it's like I said, it started as double deck. I built the double deck layout, had a few operating sessions on the double deck layout, and then came down one day and took a hammer to the upper deck and knocked it off, knocked it down. <laughs> I just ripped it off. I couldn't stand how it how I felt in the space. It just was terrible. Yep. And so I I ripped that off. And of course, when I did that, it it meant everything from my north end staging yard was now gone because that was on the upper deck <laughs> and you know half the towns were gone and the layout that was left was way too low because they had this double deck thing so what i did then is we just loosened every riser under the layout or, or loosened the bench work from the wall basically and cut a bunch of legs and had a bunch of clamps handy and i had you know three teenage sons at the time so they got on the floor on their backs and and did leg lifts and picked up the layout and we raised it up eight inches and I clamped new legs to it. And that's how we got it raised up. And then yep. over the course of a year or so, I, I rearranged it. So it, it was a, uh, I put a new staging yard in and actually what I did is lower the staging yard down the wall and, you know, rearranged the main line and pieced everything back together. And we had an operating session just about a year, just short of, uh, just short of 12 months after I had started taking the double deck off. And so the layout existed in, in pretty much in that configuration f f for six or seven years. 
a number of operating sessions. We always had fun, but I was constantly tweaking it. I was constantly saying, I want to move this town here. I want to change this area here. And it really, there was one last reconfiguration where I, I had had a right angle turn in the peninsula that was dated back to the double deck layout that I never got rid of. And it must have been 2016 or so, late 2016, I I cut up the neck of the peninsula and basically sh- you know rotated it 90 degrees so that it was just a straight a very straight run so it became a 40 foot straight peninsula as opposed to a 30 foot straight peninsula with a with a you know with a curve and uh, I never quite got the layout operating after that I mean I got the track finished I could run around the layout but we never had an operating session in that final sort of the, the ideal configuration. Uh, and so if you look at the, at the blog, I'm pretty sure somewhere on the blog, it shows the various footprints of the Roxbury sub layout. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I learned a lot. I had a lot of fun with it. We had a great time with it. I got a bunch of structures built for it. Um, we used to have oh, at least eight to 10 guys operate on it. Sometimes 12. Oh. Um, and we, and we had a lot of fun, and uh, we we have a round robin operating group out here, and you basically you sign up for it, and I I would operate maybe twice a year, and I'd at least have an operating session twice a year, and and I have to the deep dark dirty secret is I don't really relish operating sessions, I just don't, mm. um, and I if I had to spend time on model rarity, I'd much rather spend time building a model than operating. <laughs> and, okay. And so, uh, so then there was a point where I'm trying to figure out exactly how this happened, but the, uh, in, in late 2017 or so, my wife wanted to come out and we were talking about redoing the kitchen and expanding the, the old house. We were talking about expanding the kitchen yep. and, and, you know, the, the carrot that was dangled in front of me was, well, you know, where we have a deck now, we're going to make that a kitchen, but, but we I've put a foundation in there and i said all right she says so let's go look at these new houses out there because that that builder you know we can get a kitchen designed like that and i want to go see her heard from her friend these kitchens were wonderful so we got here and we looked at a house out here and it's about five and a half miles from where we lived before and so we're on we're basically on the other side of the manassas battlefield and so the we did all this and then i had a couple contractors come in and take a look at it and I, I think the cheapest price we got to do this dig the foundation out and put this new kitchen in if it wasn't like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, they didn't even want to talk to you oh boy and yeah. and there wasn't that much equity in the house and we knew the house wasn't going to increase in that much value of course at the time we didn't realize how crazy real estate prices were going to get they were already <laughs> crazy did. but they were yeah. Yeah, yeah we didn't know how, quite how crazy they were going to get right and so i said well you know <laughs> the house itself looked pretty good. The one that had the kitchen we went to look at. Why don't we go look at that again? And so we went out and looked at the house and, and, and literally like a week later, we're signing the paper to build a house. So I go, I go back home and I said, all right, well, I got it. You know, the, the renter comes in and looks at the house and goes, you, at first she tried to make me feel good. She's a friend of ours. She tried yeah. to make me feel good. And she said, well, and actually her husband had come over and operated on the layout a couple of times. <laughs> and she tried to make me feel good. And she said, well, you know, maybe you'll find somebody who has little kids who would love to have a big train set in the basement. I'm like, I don't think they want a train set this big. Yeah. And, and I don't want to be somebody who, you know, I don't want somebody calling me at, you know, you know nine o'clock at night going, I can't, I can't get, aging yard to work you know come over here and fix it <laughs> yeah there's and, a short somewhere would you come over and look at this yeah yeah fix this turnout while you're here yeah yeah and so yeah. i said no nah, i don't want to do that so yeah. i ended up uh i said no nah, the layout has to go so i, I know that so we boxed everything we had an nmra open house yeah. that has already been arranged so i had the nmra open house and i put an abandonment notice on the fascia and a whole bunch of people were shocked because i hadn't hadn't really had a chance to tell anybody I had told Paul, I had told uh, Matt Thompson, I had told Lance. They knew. And um, so. You didn't have and, a real estate open house and a, and a railroad open house at the same time, did you? No, 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 I no. Can no, imagine no. So we had, we had a, 
this was, I, I guess we, uh, we started, I had the layout down, it must have been in June. And we actually didn't have the first official, we didn't put the house on the market until September. It was August or September. Yep. And, and I fully expected the house to take seven or eight weeks to sell and then a few weeks to close and everything else. And we had an open house on Saturday. They came back on Monday and made an offer. Oh, boy. And and their only stipulation was he was moving back. He worked for a state, and he was moving back into the country. So he was, like, wanted to move in, like, this week. Like, can I – you know, he I mean, he literally wanted to, like, close on Friday. And I said, well, we can't do that, but yeah. we can accommodate something. And so we ended up renting an apartment for six months, which was – having not been apartment dwellers since, you know, our early, you know, post-college Navy days was, <laughs> was a little tough. Was yeah. an adventure. Yep. And um and when they bought the house, they bought all the furniture. Oh wow. Every stick of furniture in the house they wanted. And we ended up keeping one or two things, but they they bought everything, including by the way, our mattresses, which was kind of weird. Yeah, that's yeah. And so we, we moved into this apartment with like no furniture. It was like, we're starting all over again. The only difference is we actually have some money. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and uh, but I got the layout out of there uh, after five or six trips, cutting the layout up and hauling it upstairs. Uh, my, my parents were visiting at the time. God bless them. They, they helped me pack up my tools and my workshop and they helped me pack up. My dad and mom packed up every tree on the layout. Oh, wow. And there were thousands of trees. Yep. And all super trees. And so they boxed them all up perfectly neatly. And my mother is such an organization freak. I got to tell you this. She's such an organization that she put them in the boxes. And you know, I do fall scenery. Yeah. Right. So she didn't just put them in the box. She, we had these big, big moving boxes because, of course, the trees didn't weigh anything. So we had the large moving boxes. She put a layer of, of bubble wrap on the bottom and then a layer of paper and then a layer of trees. And then another layer of bubble wrap and another layer of paper and another layer of trees, except she didn't just put the trees in there. She put like one, one layer was orange trees. One layer was yellow trees. One layer was green trees. And, and it's as obsessive compulsive as it sounds. And that's great until I unpack them in this house to start the scenery. And realize that I've got to open the box and all I've got is green trees. And the next layer is all this is orange and all is yellow and brown and red. <laughs> so I, you know, and you can't really, I would have ended up with like a, a rainbow stripes on all my hills with the trees all the same colors. <laughs> so I had, so you had to, to unpack them all. I had to the pull mix. them all out yeah. and mess them all up. So, yeah, so uh, it was just nuts. But anyway, they did that and, and we broke out the saws all and we chopped up the layout. and. Um, I made three or four or 20 trips upstairs to the garage with the scraps. And I said, this is not doing it for me. And I solved that problem the American way. And I paid a couple of guys to haul all the junk out of the basement and into the back <laughs> of the truck. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I said, I called them up and said, how much is it to haul all this off? And he came out and took a look, you know, gave me an estimate and he says it's about 250 dollars for us to haul it out of the garage i said how much is it to haul out of the basement he said 350 dollars i said sold there you Just go do it <laughs> so you would not believe how much material was in there so we're living in the apartment now so so the yeah. roxbury sub is is long gone and i'm thinking about what i'm going to do next yep and we're living in the apartment and it was over the holidays. Like I said, we sold the house in October, so we're there over the holidays. And so my wife and I are talking about something along the way, and she says, well, you know, you're really good at doing the scenery, and you're really good at building the buildings, and and you seem really good at building the trains and, and that kind of stuff. She says, but you kept changing around the layout like you were never happy with the basic design. Yep. She said, so why you have somebody who knows what the hell they're doing design your layout for you. She didn't say it that way, but it's basically what she meant. And, and I said, oh, I don't know. I said, well, you know, Lance does this like for a living. I mean, that's what he does professionally. And right. she says, oh, well, that's interesting. And she knows Lance very well. And yep. so all of a sudden I get a phone call from Lance. He says, Merry Christmas. Your Christmas present is your layout design. Oh, Nice. So I, I worked with him on, on that and, and we talked through, uh, you know, talked through designing the layout. Um, 
I thought he was going to ask me a bunch of questions about what curve radius I wanted and how many grades I wanted and how many yards and, you know, how, how many trains I wanted to run in an operator session and, and all this stuff that you see in some of these, you know, design articles. And he says, nah, that's not, I don't care about any of that stuff right now. He says, how long do you expect to be in this house? <laughs> that was his very first question. No. Yeah. He says, the first thing we need to do is establish what the lifespan of the layout is going to be. Because if you design and start building a layout, and it's going to take you 15 years to build the layout infrastructure, and you're going to live in the house for 16 years, he says, you're going to get to operate it or enjoy it for a year. He says, right. worse is, he says, if you start this layout project, it's going to take 15 years to build, and you move in six years. He says, you're going to be perpetually building these things, and you're never going to get anything accomplished. So I said, yeah. okay, well, that's an interesting thought. <laughs> so, <laughs> so really, that's that's where we started. And and I told him that you know the honest answer at the time was we were looking at that time at retiring in about 10 years. Right. It was roughly, I think it was eight, eight and a half or nine years, but I said 10. I said, so we're looking at 10 years. I said, at, in 10 years, we might stay in this house forever i don't know we'd we'd like to but but circumstances may change you know there could be who knows there could be grand one of my one of my one of our sons might actually get a girlfriend and get married <laughs> and uh you know and then we'll, there, there'd be grandkids and then of course they're you know the lure of the grandkids and all this other kind of stuff i said i don't know yeah. what to predict right now i said but i'm pretty sure we're secure in our jobs and we're happy where we are and so i think you know 10 years is a safe bet and, and she's says, pretty happy with the kitchen. So Yeah, oh yeah. She's very happy with the house. So and she has the whole the whole upstairs is full of her quilting stuff and her sewing stuff and everything else. Awesome. And so um he said, Okay, well then let's figure it this way. Let's do like three, three, and three. He says, you know, three years to get to the the, the basic infrastructure complete, three years to to do the the fine modeling, you know, the structures and the scenery and all that kind of stuff. And then three years to just kind of enjoy it. Nice. I said, sounds like a good plan. So now we had our plan and only then did we start looking at what to model. And that's, you know, that's kind of how we got to where we are. And the other factor I had to throw into this was I'm, I'm pretty fast builder. I am pretty quick at it. I certainly can build bench work and track really fast because I keep doing it all the time. But I also have a very demanding job. I've got a really long commute. And so I had to look at a project that wasn't overwhelming. I couldn't, you know, White River Junction is a wonderful theme for a layout, but it's it's a massive project. Sure. Uh, especially in the 1950s. It was a it was a very large facility. It was it was no Cedar Hill, but it was big. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so and busy and, and et cetera. Right. So right. I said, all right. And, and really for new England railroads, you can't just buy everything off the shelf. Like Walters does not make, has not made yet a new England passenger train, mm -hmm. you know, so I can't just sign up and get the ambassador from Walters or the right. Washingtonian or something. Right. So it's, yeah. it's kind of, as much as I love, you know, the concept of modeling the main line and, and all that stuff, I, you know, I never really quite got the time to get, those those things done, those signature elements done. And so I, I said, I have to look for something that's a little more uh, of a low-key project or at least a little more attainable. And that's when I set up the Richford branch. So what's that What's that based off of? Where, where did you come up with this, uh, this idea? Well, I'd first seen it in a couple of those older uh, steam era books that I had. There's always yeah. a few, there's always a few pictures of the Richford branch, like two or three of them. And, and as it turned out, they're all taken from the same places, mostly by the same guys, maybe on different days. But, uh, but as I started digging into it further, and especially now that like there's an internet, I could, I could look stuff up and find that, you know, those towns up there now that, well, the Richford branch itself now is a, is a bike trail. It's a hiking trail. Yeah. Um, and it's, for those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a, like a 25 or so mile long branch from St. Albans. And it skirts the Canadian border, you know, just south of the Canadian border, and ends up in Richford, where it connects with the Canadian Pacific. Hmm. And uh, Neil Schofield models the other side of Richford on his okay. in, in, uh, 
30 years later than I do, but the other side of Richford. So he models the CP side of Richford. I model the CV side of Richford. And, uh, there, and, and again, now you, if you look on Google Earth or Google Maps right now, all you will see where the CV yard was is a gas station that if you look very closely, you can see buried within the gas station what looks like it might have been a railroad station. And, and that's the old CV Richford station. Okay. And there is literally not, there's just an open field all around it. But at in my modeling, that was actually a yard hmm. and it was a terminal of the, of the branch. And so there were several industries there. There's a freight house. There was a large plywood plant. Uh, and so there was, as I started uncovering these things, I started realizing that the further back in time I went, the more interesting the Richford branch got, right? To model the Richford branches I saw in 19, I guess I chased, chased the train up there in 1987 or 88 or so. And it was a pair of SW 1200s and a few, a few box cars and a couple of covered hoppers. And it basically started in St. Albans and ran all the way to the CP connection. And I don't, I, it might've dropped off a couple of cars somewhere. I think it stopped once and dropped off some cars. Um, but that, that's what it was. But when you go back 30 years earlier, there were, there were local industries. Uh, there was a large, a, there still is a large paper mill, but at the time it was rail served. And so there was, you know, a lot of neat, neat along the line. There was interchange with the St. Johnsbury and Lamoille County. Uh, yep. And so that's you know, everybody's favorite New England short line. And, <laughs> you know, which eventually became the Lamoille Valley, of course. Right. And, you know, so I, I thought, well, this is something that might be the, the bone of a decent layout. And, there was actually a point where when we were still in the old house where I had considered uh, converting the Roxbury sub layout into a Richford branch layout, but that would have been, that would basically been a, you know, other than the bench work would have been a total redo. Um, so I never did that, but I had started gathering information on the Richford branch probably 10, 15 years ago. So when, I heard from Lance and he says, I'm going to design the layout for you. I said, well, here's a couple of possibilities. And I, and I offered a few of the possibilities I had in mind. And, you know, we reviewed why the mainline layout or the, you know, or layout just focused on white river junction at this point is, or that point was just not logical for me. And then I, I kind of threw this branch out there as just a thought. I said, and then I, you know, I, this, this branch, like 25 mile long branch up there that the CV didn't have a lot of branch lines, but this one was an interesting one. And the nice part about it is it didn't like end at a major city. It ended like in the middle of literally in nowhere. And you know, it, so it's not like some project that would require building hundreds of structures. And he says, well, let, send me what you got on that and I'll take a look at it. And gosh, a couple of, maybe a week or so later, he sent me an initial sketch uh, for what he had in mind. And of course I, I gave him all kinds of suggestions and thoughts and he immediately shot them all down. <laughs> and, um, you know, cause I, I wanted to add more stuff to it, right? That's the, the yeah. usual drill, right? He says, yeah, you know, he says, get this built and this will be fine. So, and, and really uh, the layout that's down there right now, I went, I went to Ikea in July of 2018 and bought my bench work. And, yep. um, and the worst part about the bench work was painting it, honestly. And then um, I had essentially all the infrastructure done. The bench work was certainly done and the main line and most of the sidings and stuff were all in and wired uh, within a year. It was probably, wow. yeah, probably mid 2019. And then we had an open house here for the railroad guys. We have a clubhouse here in the neighborhood. And one of the the guys that runs our operating group wanted to have a timetable and train order class for everybody. So Steve King, um, who's one of our local guys here, um, and uh, Steve is the guy who owns a railroad called the Virginia Midland. Yep. And it's part of, you know, the, the Allen's VNO and Tony's VN or AM. Yep. And, so Steve is an expert on timetable and train order stuff. He actually literally wrote the book on it. And so he gave a class on it. And it was, I still remember it was March 8th, 2020. Yeah. And um, 
and we had it because we're right around the corner. Everybody wanted to see the layout. So we had a little open house here and Lance came over and took a look at, at what I had done to his design and how I had built his design. And everybody came over here and said, this is wonderful. We can't wait to come back and operate. And of course, three days later, I was working at home for COVID yeah. and you know, we didn't have anybody here until last fall. <laughs> yeah. That's right. March 8th. Yeah. Right about right about St. Patrick's day, I yeah. think is kind of like the marker, right? Where everything just kind of fell apart. Yeah. It was just, yeah. well, it was funny because you know, I, I work for a, I work with a guy who are one of my work on the layout with a guy, not work, work, but work mm-hmm. on the layout with uh, a guy who works for uh, the food and drug administration. And he was during this whole session with Steve King, he kept getting these messages and he's like, this is, this is going to be bad. And he just, I remember him telling me that he says, this is going to be, of course I had no idea what he meant by this is going to be bad, but he said, this is going to be bad. So uh, yeah, it was just nuts. But um, I, I got some things done during COVID. I actually didn't like dive into the layout during COVID and finish it. I guess some people did. I, I, I wasn't able to, I just, I think yeah. part of it was I'm like, well, why bother? Nobody's coming over. So. Yeah, that, that does take. A, that di- I remember it did. It does. It takes a little bit of wind out of your sails to not be able to share it. And you know, our, our operating group went through it. We, we thankfully found Zoom and used that to stay connected. But mm-hmm. it was hard to stay motivated. And thankfully, us con- connecting kind of helped push each other, put a hand on each other's back. But, I mean, you seem to be ahead. You talked about this 3-3-3 three, three, and three plan. It sounds like you're a little bit ahead on that 3-3-3 three, three, and three plan. Uh, yeah, I'm getting there. Uh, the yeah. thing that's that I haven't shown is what you don't see is the places that do have structures or lots yeah. of structures. Yeah. Um, there's a few, uh, and, and that's kind of the next, that'll be the next project. Um, I was laser cutting the the paper the main paper mill building. Um, which is about three and a half feet long. Um, and I think it has 70 something windows in it. So I've got to put all those in there. Yeah. Um, the, and then the plywood plant is on, there's, there's two peninsulas, the way that the layout structure, and you've seen the track plan, but there's a basically an around the wall section. That's the main line. That's the, the branches main line. And then there's a, uh, there's two peninsulas. The larger one is Richford yard itself. And the smaller one is the Sheldon Sheldon Springs uh, paper mill, and so the uh, the the basic schematic is you start at the staging yard, which is not where it shows up on the track plan on the blog. It's actually in a different spot. Uh, Lance designed the layout. I didn't tell you this story. <laughs> Lance designed the layout based on measurements I gave him of the model house, yep. and our house is identical to the model for the yep. most part, except when they did our house, somehow our basement ended up a foot longer. Yeah. And, and and I should say not the basement itself is the same size, but the, the way the rooms are broken up, my yep. layout room is a foot longer than what I had given Lance as a measurement. Yeah. So I was able to put the, when you look at the track plan on the blog, the top part where it says staging is actually another town now. I changed that to another. It's a very small town, but it's another town. Mm-hmm. And then we're all the way on the right where it, it it says interchange and CP main dummy. CP main dummy now actually curves down and goes along that short wall and there's two tracks there. And that is the, uh, that is the St. Albans staging area. Okay. So the staging yard is actually off to the, to the right there because this, the like I said, the layout is actually a foot wider than it shows up on this plan, or you yep. know, the you know foot longer. So that's uh, other than that, it's pretty much built the way he's got it designed here. I mean, there's there's a couple other little books um, all the way on the left where there's the alcove. I I salvaged a bridge. Um, in a river scene from the old layout. It's the one piece of the old layout I kept. And so where it's double track there on that alcove on the top, right under where it says specs and 36 inch mainline radius and everything else, um, that passing siding isn't quite that long. And the bridge is that other bridge is there. And uh, the St. Johnsbury interchange track comes off where it says creamery. Now that's actually where the St. J interchange track is. And the creamery is where it says interchange. I switched those around. Uh, 
just didn't like how it how it laid out with the turnout where it says interchange there. I didn't like how that turnout laid out, so I switched it around. A couple of minor things like that, but really, other than that, pretty much the whole layout is built just like Lance designed it here. Yeah, there's, there's quite a value. We we obviously had Lance on the show, and you know we we talked about the why and his ability to bring out your why and you know in, in incorporate the things that you were wanting within your layout is just a it's such an amazing talent that he's got to do that and and, and tap into that so yeah don't tell him have, that his head's big enough already well maybe he won't listen to this one he's <laughs> he already probably got his. Won't. maybe maybe he'll listen to his again who knows <laughs> he's right? probably listened to his 100 times by now i think he's writing an apology letter to tom kolmoski for saying that he was in the mexican cartel but <laughs> oh, maybe we'll see how we'll see how that one goes <laughs> Did but he say that? He did say that. He did say that. That was a that was a uh, around the layout exclusive. All right. so, I don't feel so bad picking on him then. There you go, Marty. We've we've gone for an hour and I don't know hour fifteen or so, and we're, okay. we're going to wrap it up because boy, but we have so much more to talk about. We're going to definitely have you back. We'll we'll talk more about uh, your time at uh, MR and you know we even even touching some of the other th- stuff that you've done and then Central Vermont Historical Society. I'm sure you got a lot there as well. So amazing how a, a cab ride in New London kind of took you to two futures you know, between <laughs> the central Vermont and then, then the Navy too, because you were there for a submarine and boy, that kind of laid out a path for you. And it's really cool to hear that story. So I want to thank you again for coming on around the layout and sharing your story. Oh, well, thanks so much for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us for this episode of around the layout. Learn more about today's show on our Facebook page, facebook.com backslash around the layout. Show your support by becoming an operating crew member at patreon.com backslash around the layout podcast. Past episodes and more can be found on our website around the layout.com and send us your feedback around the layout at gmail.com. Thanks for hanging out with us around the layout.